Hello and welcome to the India Story, the one show that gives you the complete view on the world from India and tells you about all the big developments that are taking place uh, out here. Today, a very special exclusive interview with the Israeli ambassador to India, Naur Gilon. He talks to us not just about the terror attacks that took place on October the 7th, but also the humanitarian crisis that seems to be taking place in Gaza, the Israeli reaction, the possibility of a ground offensive, the status uh, with the hostages there in Gaza, Israel's expectations of India, the possibility of this becoming a wider conflict, and a lot more. That special exclusive interview coming up for you in just a couple of minutes. But also on the show, we're going to be talking about Qatar, where eight Indians have been sentenced to death and what possibly will happen there. And I'm going to be giving you my take on the situation between India and Canada. A crisis that is showing no signs of blowing over. Okay, a thaw here and there with the restarting of visas, but that's a conflict and a cold war, if you like, that doesn't seem to be blowing over anytime soon. And I'll be telling you the reasons why, and also getting in a couple of very big experts to talk about that. Well, let's start with some of the big news that has been making the headlines this week, and starting with Qatar, which on the 26th of October sentenced eight former Indian Navy officers to death reportedly on charges of spying and espionage. These former officers were employed with a private defense firm uh, in Qatar and were detained by the Qatari Intelligence Service in Doha on August the 30th last year. While the Qatari government uh, never officially disclosed the charges against them, reports say that they stand accused of spying on Qatar's advanced submarines, which were being constructed in collaboration with an Italian shipbuilding company for Israel. The eight veterans were employed by a defense services provider owned by Omani National, a required retired squadron leader of the Royal Omani Air Force, who was also arrested, but then was subsequently released in November. Now, India has expressed shock at all of this, and expressing shock in the death sentence, the MEA in a statement said, it is exploring all legal options to contest the sentence. So, clearly, it is a difficult situation that is unfolding out there. And also, a lot of people are wondering about how this plays out in the geopolitics of the entire region. It's no secret that Qatar has, in recent times, become also a hub for, well, groups like the Hamas, for example, and others who've been taking shelter out there. Qatar has also been accused of being very involved in anti-Israeli activities, uh, Al Jazeera, you know, the controversies around that. Is this a reaction to some of the stances that India has been taking on Israel? Is this something completely unconnected? A lot of things will need to be understood, and we'll see how the situation unfolds in Qatar with those eight former Indian Navy officers. Well, let's turn now to the special big interview here on the India Story this week. The ambassador of Israel to India, now Gillon. Now, I don't have to tell you that international headlines continue to be fixed on the situation uh, in the Middle East, in particular what seems to be a humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in the Gaza Strip with a large number of civilian casualties. But that, of course, after that terrible terror attack by Hamas on October the 7th, in which a large number of Israeli civilians died and a large number of them were also taken hostage. So a number of issues, of course, need to be looked at, including whether there's going to be a ground offensive, what happens with the humanitarian situation in Gaza, what can be done to minimize civilian casualties, does this have broader implications for the region? And, of course, what Israel expects of India. We've heard the ambassador saying, for example, that he would like India to declare Hamas as a terrorist organization. So without further ado, here's my conversation with the ambassador of Israel to India, Naur Gilon, just a short while back. Well, we now have with us on the India story His Excellency, the ambassador of Israel to India, Mr. Naur Gilon, I wish, uh, Your Excellency, we were speaking in, uh, in more pleasant times uh, than this. Um, let me just begin by asking you, you know, it's, it's not that many days since the 7th of October. There must still be a lot of shock, a lot of sorrow, a lot of grieving in Israel and concern about the fate of the hostages. Yeah, uh, this uh, unprecedented attack on Israel uh, on October 7th, uh, really, it's something we never knew before. 
something in the magnitude and the viciousness of the attack. We had, uh, you know, the numbers, just understanding. They came in the morning of a Jewish holiday, invaded 30 uh, Jewish communities. Uh, they killed around 1,400 people, which uh, if you compare it in numbers and percentage to India, it's more than two lakh people. In one day, in 12 hours, in 10, 12 hours, they went from house to house and butchered, really, families. They burned kids together. They decapitated, they raped, they shot children, uh, and they took uh, quite many uh, hostages. We don't know the exact number, and, and when you're asking if we are still mourning, uh, only half of the people were buried so far, more or less. We, di we still didn't identify quite a large, we identify now 80% of the, of the missing, and there's still, still people missing. So the numbers don't count yet, we don't know exactly how much are, uh, are kidnapped and how many, how many are alive, and they kidnapped from nine months old children, babies, to uh, 85, uh, 80, which was released. And so the country is still going through the trauma. It's not over yet, and if I am right, it's not going away anytime soon. I mean, it will stay with us as a trauma, as a scar, for a very long time. Uh, you, you made a very, you know, fascinating comparison there. It's like per capita, if you compare it to India, there's like two lakh people dying. India has been through Mumbai, 26, 11, 9, 11, but the number of people uh, is, is, if you're looking at it from a percentage point, a lot of people in Israel would therefore know somebody who has either been killed or taken hostage. Yeah, uh, e even in an embassy, which is a small, uh, s relatively small representation of Israel, we have here uh, two cousins who were who killed, two cousins of, of Israelis who work in the embassy. We had many friends of people who were killed. Uh, we have quite a few people who are after military service, younger people. So their friends were either in the party or in the military part, which was... So, yeah, even for us here, uh, we know, you know, everyone knows every, uh, some, someone uh, connected, so it's a huge trauma. And in Israel, of course, it's a very small country, and, and uh, everyone knows everyone, and the trauma is there, a very deep trauma. And it's continuing. Don't forget that Israel is under already, uh, we got 8,000 rockets from Gaza towards Israeli population. So even on my personal level, I have, my wife went to, uh, is in Israel to be with the, with the rest of the family to help them as much as she can. So my wife is there, my four children are there, my five grandchildren are there, my father who is reaching 89 now, my in-laws who are not much younger than him. All these people, a few times a day, they go into the shelter. Uh, yesterday, a bomb was able to penetrate through Iron Dome in Rishon Etzion, where my father, my father uh, lives, not too far from his home. No, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that is going, uh, everyone is carrying some kind of, of load, uh, emotional load out of this uh, thing. Uh, Master Kinnan, though it has to be said, when you're looking at the situation now, 20 days later, it's almost seeming as though the world's getting divided into two sides. There's a certain view which is saying, look what happened on October the 7th, look at the suffering that uh, the Israeli people went through. Um, but at the same time, there's also a great deal of concern and shock and <coughs> horror and sympathy at, at what's happening in Gaza right now because 700, 800 people, if, they are, if, are, if there are 700 or 800 people dying every single day, Gaza is also only 2.2 million people. So there are a lot of people dying there and a lot of them would be innocents. Uh, I would go maybe, I think that there is no comparison whatsoever. So one is that there is a vicious attack intended at civilian populations, by the way, also the rockets from Gaza are going to civilian population. They're not going to any military camps or any... This is not the idea. They want very heavily populated areas. The other problem is that Hamas already for... In the, in the previous skirmishes and, and fights that we had with them, always used the civilian population as their human shield. And why do they do that? Because they cannot uh, compete, uh, fight with the Israeli Defense Forces in open uh, area without this protection. So. It's not by coincidence that a few days ago a hospital was hit by a rocket uh, of Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And uh, this is, they put it next to hospitals, they put it next to schools, hoping that when we retaliate, we hit schools or hospitals or whatever damage we can create, we, we might create in order to have pressure, international pressure on Israel 
to stop the, the operation. So their way to, is to hit and then come behind and hit behind their population. So we find in a situation where Israel, in the one hand, is trying to protect with Iron Dome and everything our civilian population. And on the other hand, we are trying also to protect the Gazan civilian population from two reasons. One is the humanitarian, we don't want to kill people, and we are law-abiding people, international law and everything. And the other one is we understand that if we make mistakes and hit a civilian population, we will be uh, limited in our time of operation. Uh, there will be pressure on us to stop. So we have the humanitarian is the leading one, but the, also on the other, we understand the cost of mistake. We are doing any effort to avert the situation where we hit civilians, but uh, Hamas is underground, letting the civilians be above. If we, we do according to international law, you have to, to warn people uh, not to be in areas. So we, we ask the population to go south, the northern, because we, are, we intend to go into land operation, into the northern part. And Hamas is forbidding them from going down. They put roadblocks. Uh, they threaten them. We, we have some... Uh, but there are airstrikes that have taken place in the south as well. You've told people to move south, but there are airstrikes taking place in the south as well. And so you, that's the reason why you know, the United Nations and others have also been coming out and saying, where do the people go? Um, also on the question of things like fuel supplies, which you are saying you don't allow fuel supplies to go in because Hamas would use it to you know, ventilate the tunnels or whatever it is that they're doing, but that has its own humanitarian consequences. So, first of all, uh, we agreed with the UN on zones where they can take the people uh, out of the uh, inhabited areas in, other, in order for them to be in a place that is uh, not going to be touched. You have to understand there is no immunity. The fact that we want to go in the ground operation and we will go to the north probably in the main effort, first main effort, doesn't mean that other parts can be immune. So in this way, we are giving Im immunity to also to the terrorists. No, the effort will be concentrated there, but we will do also targeting strikes if we know, have information of people, of terrorists hiding and things like that. We do that, of course, but it's much safer for the population to be in the south rather than in the north. That's very clear. When it comes to humanitarian, again, you know, uh, according to international law, let's start from the dry law. If the supply that you want to give anything is used in order to hit the population of the other side, you are not supposed to give it. You are even expected not to do that. And fuel, as you said, it's, it's for, two, for the rockets it's used. And it's used also to ventilate these tunnels that are there in order to attack uh, Israeli soldiers hide from them and attack them uh, once they are there. So in general, we are not, we are not, we don't have to. But even worse than that, uh, Hamas, uh, UNRWA, the UN organization there, had uh, fuel in the, its storage. Hamas came. It was intended for all the population. Hamas came, just I think half a million liters, just took from them. UNRWA tweeted it. So it's not, uh, you know, the situation is very complex. Even if we give something to, to the population, it will go to the needs of Hamas because they control the area. So, I, you know, the, it's very sad for the population, but that's the, that's the fact of life. I mean... If I could just, you know, here in India, we know strangers to terror. You know, you know we, we've suffered over many, many years with, with terror attacks. So if I could just share one of the examples uh, uh, which of how to respond to that, which I've seen a lot of people talking about in social, uh, on social media. After 26-11, which was, you know, when, when, when a, a very similar attack happened on India, there wasn't an immediate reaction. And in fact, a long period was built up to almost get international opinion very strongly against Pakistan and that played itself out rather well over the last 15-20 uh, years from an Indian point of view that Pakistan has now been painted as a state sponsor of terror. I'm just putting this to you as a hypothesis. Do you think Israel moved too fast in like immediately going in and attacking Gaza? The, the, the world had no time to really register or to sympathize with what had happened on October the 7th because the focus immediately shifted to Gaza and those pictures of Palestinian children in Gaza. No, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that people don't understand what happened on October 7. This is a change of paradigm. What happened in October 7, that on Friday evening, 6, October 6, we went to sleep when, with, with Hamas as our uh, neighbor in our minds. 
we woke up in the morning with ISIS as our neighbor. So we thought that Hamas is a more pragmatic organization. The concept that failed in Israel, that led to many failures afterwards, probably it will be still investigated when the, when the guns stop, as we say, at the end of the war. Uh, the concept was that Hamas is a, has some responsibility as the ruler of Gaza to its citizens. So if you do dual containment, on the one hand, you have deterrence on the military side. On the other, the other hand, we work with them to improve the level of living of the population. And this means that we enabled tens of thousands to go and work in Israel, which brought a lot of money. We let merchandise go in almost freely, as long as it was not uh, te theoretically used for terror. But we see how well that worked. And everything collapsed because we didn't get it that they don't care about the population. We didn't get it that when they use the population as human shields, it's a sign to you in the past that they don't care about the population. They care about their ideology. If you go into the, the covenant of Hamas, they don't accept uh, is, is Israel in any kind of border. It's a different, you know, it's a different, so since it's a, it's a watershed event from our point of view, we must distract Hamas. They cannot stay in the area. They cannot stay from two reasons. One is that they will repeat their atrocities. And second, if it will be perceived that this jihadist ISIS Hamas organization, one, it will give fuel and backwind, backpush, to many jihadist organizations that were, you know, the Islamic State, the ISIS, the Daesh people, who were suppressed by American attacks and everything, but they're still there. I mean, first of all, the ideology is within the people, and the people are still maybe dispersed, maybe went back to their countries, may, the organizational part, but if they feel that the strongest part, actor in their region, Israel, they can win against them. Hamas, an organization like Hamas can win, it means that they get hope to, and this will so you're saying a sign of weakness, it will be interpreted as a sign of weakness which would then lead to other attacks? Weakness to Israel, Israel will be attacked, but not only Israel. Then you will see these people are all around, they are in Syria, they are in Iraq, they are, even in this region, people, high numbers went to ISIS. These people probably went back, the ideology is probably with them. They, practically, they cannot execute it now, but if they feel that there is a research, research of, of, you know, of energy and support, they might, it might come back also in, the, in, in our region, in the West Asia, in, to threaten the moderate regimes. It can go to Europe, it can come to this region. You know, every, every place that there, is, there are the roots there planted, if you now give water to the plants, they might grow, unfortunately. Right. We heard, we've heard, uh, uh, you know, the, this talk of this ground offensive, some reports that the United States has, you know, asked for a slight delay before the ground offensive proceeds. When that ground offensive, or if that ground offensive actually happens, which will probably be required to defeat Hamas, is there not a slight concern in your mind that that could be a quagmire? Because frankly, urban fighting, one thing to, to, to bomb from the skies. When you're actually going in on the ground in a heavily built up area, in an area which is very densely populated and lots of civilians out there, with an enemy that is expecting you and hiding in tunnels below, it could lead to a lot of bloodshed. It's not going to be a simple war. And it could mean a prolonged period when deaths are mounting and a time when international pressure will continue to build up on Israel. Is that the scenario which perhaps Hamas is almost expecting you to get into? I think that uh, Hamas are expecting us. That's why we are doing the aerial campaign to soften the places where they waited for us, where they prepared tunnels, booby traps, bombs, all that we are trying to eliminate before we come in. So I think, I hope, that, our, uh, that Israel Defense Forces are preparing for them some surprises in the sense of how we operate in comparison to the par past because they are waiting, like everyone, to, for us to take action like we took in the past. It's a different ballgame. It's not going to be like in the past. Casualties on our side for sure. On the other side, also probably, but that's why we ask the population, get away. Okay, Hamas are under the, the ground in the tunnels. Leave them to fight us. We will fight them. If there is no popul civilian population, as we ask them to evacuate, there will not be civilian uh, collateral damage. That's our aim here. We don't want to. We don't want them to use the, the the human shields, their population, and we want you know 
that's the idea here. I think if, if, they, if it's done as it should be done, uh, there will be much less collateral damage than any other option that we have. Of course, the other wild card in all of this is the extent to which it broadens. I mean, I've heard you saying and others saying that there was an Iranian hand in this and maybe Iranian planning, in which case, again, Iran would be expecting exactly what you're saying. So the question is, what happens in the north with Hezbollah? What happens with Syria? What happens with Iran directly? Uh, and there are lots of wild cards out there, which I'm sure you don't completely know right now. So there is no doubt, I think, in anyone's mind who knows the Middle East and what's happening in seeing the picture, that Iran is behind it one way or another. For first is that Iran has been sponsoring, training and equipping Hamas for many, many years. Second, the, the you know, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is really part of the more, it's, it's as if it's part of the Iranian army, Revolutionary Guards, they immediately started threatening and uh, starting a, a low-intensity war against Israel uh, on the northern border and threatening Israel that if we go to ground offense, they will open a full, full-scale full war. Uh, Houthis from Yemen that are Iranian arms also shot about 20 objects. I say objects because UAVs and the... Uh, and the mis uh, cruise missiles that were intercepted by a U.S. ship uh, there were shot towards Israel. Uh, in Syria, probably Shiite militias shot also from the Golan Heights towards Israel. They're trying to give us the feeling that everything is erupting. But since, as I said before, we have no other option. If we, and we sent the warnings to Hezbollah. And we told them, if there will be war, it, it, they, they have hundred. Uh, up to 130, 150,000 rockets accurate because uh, Iran helped them make them more accurate and very heavy load rockets. So they can create damage, but so can we. So we warned them, we don't want the second front. Don't make us open it because we know how to deal with two fronts. So we are hoping that they don't do that. I, I hope that the Iranians are smart enough to understand that if they open two fronts, they will lose two, two, two arms that they have. Both of them are arms of Iran, and we are capable, well capable of taking care, cutting these two arms. Yeah. And uh, this is the message to Iran. I mean, they're trying, we have a war with Iran, okay? We have a war with Iran. It's uh, through proxy now, uh, but we have it. It's there. We have a war with Hezbollah. It's low intensity, but it's there. Our first priority now is taking care of eliminating the Hamas ISIS terror organization. Right. As, as this happens, of course, you, you must be keeping an eye on global, on, on world opinion, on global opinion, on the scenes that we're seeing on the streets, including in America, in Europe, and other places. Um, if you're looking at that, it almost seems that a lot of the outrage and the larger number of the crowds and all of that are almost saying Israel is to blame out here. Uh, Israel is responsible for dead Palestinian children. Israel is responsible <clears throat> for the humanitarian crisis. The original terror attack is almost, you know, sidelined or been forgotten in, in all of this. Are you bemused by this, the sort of international uh, reaction? Uh, I'm, I'm used to it. I'm a 34-year veteran diplomat, served a lot in US and Europe. It's always like that. It's always like that. Uh, look, we are outnumbered in the world. We are one five, 15 million Jews in the world almost 8 million out of them, 7 and a half, 8 million out of them in Israel, okay? That's the reality. We were always a minority. In the UN, in the General Assembly, we always lose because the, uh, the Arab group, together with the non-aligned, are automatic majority. We know that. It's, you know, it's a question of here of doing the right thing. We are supported by the, I think, almost all the democratic governments in the world, especially the big ones. The US is there, Europe the majority of the countries, look at the number of leaders who came from the leaders of Germany, of France, of the US, of course, Biden. Many, many leaders came to Israel, to, to uh, Austria, Czech Republic, to uh, share their, uh, or show their solidarity with Israel. The leadership level, we are there. Street level, you cannot, you, you know, you have people who automatically, it's very hard after such a tragedy like October 7, not for normal people, not to have some empathy towards Israel. But what happened is that this uh, false accusation of the hospital, they just went, waited for the time to go back to the 
zone of comfort, these people. Because most of them, I mean, of the, originally dislike Israel and, you know, yeah. and now, oh, you see, they, in the hospital, false accusation, you know, it was amazing, by the way, that we didn't finish counting the bodies, we are not sure yet and everything. But five minutes after the the false the, the short firing of the rocket, 471 people. 471 people. They counted already. You know, 471. Then, by the way, one by one, the Americans came out separately and said uh, that their intelligence inf and intel, their own intel, says it's not Israel. And then the French came out and said not Israel. And I saw also in, uh, that they said that the casualty number is probably close to 50 maximum. So you know the whole thing. And again. People went to their basics. So people who are against Israel found it as a good excuse to run back to Israel, even when the stories were retracted and everything. It doesn't matter. Facts don't matter. People, anymore. people are going with whatever their beliefs are. Yeah. How do you see the see the sort of response that has come from from India? There's been a, there was a very strong condemnation from Prime Minister Modi on day one. <clears throat> very strong view against terror. At the same time, expressions about the humanitarian situation in Gaza and the sending of supplies there. I know that you've said that you would like India to declare Hamas as a as a terror outfit, but in general, what's been the reaction from India? So first of all, it was very swift and strong by Prime Minister Modi because in the afternoon, I think around the four four thirty four forty five. Uh, India time, he already uh, tweeted uh, a very strong uh, condemnation to terror and support to Israel. He did the second tweet after uh, he spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu a few days later. But he was among the first, I think, leaders to do that. And he did it in, an, in a clear way. And when the picture was not, the full picture was not clear yet. We then thought that the numbers are much, much, much lesser. Uh, we didn't understand the magnitude yet, we, and, and I think that was very, very strong and very, very important. It's okay, humanitarian, we also care about humanitarian. We, we, I separate, and that's why I don't like when UN Secretary General doesn't understand why we blew up on him. And I will tell you very simply, there is no context for murdering, raping, kidnapping, all these atrocities, de decapitating, there is no context for that. This is inhumane, and humane people should deplore that and not start saying you have to see it in a wider context. There is no context. There is no political. There is no any other context. This is un undone. People, humans don't do that. And this had to be deplored. And that's why we, again, we don't see any justification to do that. The condemnation has to be clear. At the same time, after you condemned in a very strong way, you can say, okay, let's see how we are coming out of it, what we are doing for the future, what, how can we better or worse. I separate the humanitarian one. We are helping the humanitarian too. We did the humanitarian conv convoys here already for, for almost a week now coming in. It's okay. So is it okay? So, for example, the, the, the reaction that would strike you as being the normal, correct reaction almost to this is to say, Condemnation of the terror attack with no ifs and buts, nothing justified the slaughter of innocents in that, in that brutal manner. At the same time, effort should be done to minimize humanitarian and civilian deaths in Gaza and people should not, not suffer unnecessarily. And at some point in the future, we will have to try and figure out a long-term solution to whatever issues there are there. Is that, is that a fair... Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, I, th take? I think it is a, it is a fair... And I said, I said that the thumb rule that I, I put also on Twitter that, you know, scroll down the feed of the people who are now uh, criticizing is Israel and see if uh, October 7th, did they unequivocally uh, condemn this attack with, without ifs and context or everything. Just said, this is not humane, not acceptable. We share the grief with Israel. Okay, that's, uh, we condemn terror and we share the grief. If they did that, they bought their, their moral place by the table to come now and speak about the suffering of others. If they didn't do that, it means that they, are, they, they have only one kind of suffering. They don't care about the other suffering. So, I mean, this is, a, and that's why, as I say, in India, the support, the wide support we got here is amazing. So we speak about the prime minister, but people all around. Actually, in numerical terms, you know, India probably contributes a lot on social media to, his, to you know, the, the numbers tweeting for Israel. I, I, I think so. I think so. And, and you know, it's, it's very warm support. I mean, I said it in an interview before that I could have built probably another, maybe another two IDFs, Israeli Defense Forces size, 
just from the people who told, I want to go and even fight, or join the IDF or, you know, it's, it's an amazing, I have been, as I said, a veteran diplomat, I served in quite many friendly countries to Israel, yeah. and I saw many friends, but here it's so wide, so big, it's incredible. And I think, you know, just before we end, you know, looking a little bit at the future, one sort of this, uh, you know, ties it's, uh, itself down, because already you have people saying, look at what has happened, uh, you know, how can things be done? Do you believe that in the future that certain mistakes were made? I'm saying once we've gone past, as you said, you passed your test. I did pass your test, so I can now. Uh, I, I I think I've earned my the, the moral uh, ticket that you said you should have to, to do that. The fact that settlements continued, the fact that certain hardline policies were continued, the fact that no openings were made over a period of time. Do you think all of that is something that will have to be addressed going forward? Maybe. You know, there has to be thought. And by the way, it's not just me no. saying this. There were a lot of people when no, I was in Israel I, I, in March who said the same thing. I want to go back, first of all, to 2005 with your permission. 2005, Israel did the disengagement from Gaza. What is the disengagement? We took out of Gaza more than 10,000 civili Israeli civilians living there. We dismantled more than 20 communities. We went out. 2006, elections, Hamas, we, we, gave, we left it to the Palestinian Authority. To, to Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, 2006, elections, Hamas wins over the Palestinian Authority. 2007, they throw them out of Gaza physically by killing, by throwing from rooftops and everything. So there are no settlements in Gaza. They are not friends of, uh, of Palestinian Authority. I always I, I, I am amused, hardly, but amused to see the Palestinian representative around the world representing Gaza. If they, these representatives, will want to go and visit Gaza, like their leaders, I don't know if they will go in, but they will not come alive out. They are the enemies of Hamas. But now they are speaking, and I always also about that. There is no representation without taxation. You know, if you assume you are the representative, also, okay, take also responsibility to the atrocities that they do, to the human shields, to all the rest. So you take, you know, they take the easy path and do that. So there is no background, in, and, and Hamas do not accept, as I said, in covenant, do not accept Israel in any borders. It's not a political problem with Hamas. That's why they will disappear. We have to make them disappear. They are not partners for anything, and ISIS is not a partner for anything. So, you know, taking it now to settlements from 2005, nothing there. No, no Israeli. They are independent. They are running their own life. So we have an issue with the Palestinian Authority, Today, if you would want, if there would be the magic wand and you want to do the state, two-state solution, you can't do two-state. You can do three-state. You can do something with the Palestinian Authority, but then Gaza is a separate uh, entity. Yeah. So it's much more complicated. I'm not, I don't want to say that anyone is perfect of mistakes. This is not the issue here. But the issue is to understand that we are not a, in another skirmish and another, no. It's a watershed event. It's a game changer. We have to get rid of Hamas for the well-being of the Palestinian Authority, because they are risking Palestinian Authority also in Judea and Samaria, for the well-being of the moderates around the world, of Europe, of South Asia, of, of, of South Asia, all the places where there are remnants of the jihadists, because this is a real threat. Ambassador Gillon, we're going to have to leave it there. There will be a time to come and have a conversation about the long-term future of the Middle East. This perhaps is not it. We'll, we'll come back and have a conversation with you on that at a, at a later date. But thank you thank so much. You. For thank you very much. Thank you. With so much talk of terror and reaction to terror, let's turn our attention back to that simmering cold war that seems to be taking place between India and Canada. Ever since Justin Trudeau made his extraordinary accusation of having credible allegations linking India to the death of a Khalistani activist in Canada. Now, several developments have taken place over the past few days. India has restarted the visa process, which is being seen as a possible integration of some sort of a thaw. But on the other hand, Canada has been forced to withdraw 41 diplomats on grounds of parity. That led to a doubling down by Justin Trudeau, who promptly accused India of violating the Vienna Convention. In a sign of Anglosphere solidarity, the US, the UK, Australia and New Zealand seem to support that stance by Canada. 
India reacted angrily by saying that the Vienna Convention allows receiving countries to specify a fair number of diplomats and that there's no violation of the Vienna Convention taking place at all, certainly not on India's side. Look, this entire situation isn't going away anytime soon. And there are some indications that further escalations could take place, like India potentially taking Canada to international bodies for supporting terrorism. That could be on the cards. Now, why is all of this happening? Look at the state of the world. The war in Ukraine, the war between Israel and Gaza, the threat of Chinese aggression in East Asia, the emergence of a powerful anti-Western axis between China, Russia and Iran. The last thing that the West probably wanted was a major crisis with India, thanks to a still unsubstantiated allegation made by this man, Justin Trudeau. It's frankly not what India wanted either, but I can tell you one thing. I strongly, strongly doubt that India will be ready or able to blink on this issue. And that's probably something that the West should keep in mind. Why, you ask? Well, actually, that question was repeatedly asked to me on a recent trip to the United States, including by many seasoned India watchers. They were all somewhat surprised by the very hardline Indian response to Canada. And this is what I told them. I told them it's not about Niger. It's about the attitude of countries like Canada to terrorists who target India and Indian interests. And that includes Indian diplomats. Look, terror is a red line for India. It is a red line for many countries around the world. I mean, look at the way that America and most countries in the West are responding to the Hamas terror attack on Israel. That includes Justin Trudeau, by the way. Take a look at his reaction. They all say, Israel has a right to defend itself against terror. That's why they are supporting the strikes on Gaza, strikes that have killed thousands and thousands of civilians. It's terror, they say. It must be dealt with. It was the same stance when it came to Afghanistan, to Syria, to ISIS, to Iraq. You get the picture. Now, India asks, and has been asking for a long time, where do those principles go when it comes to terror that targets India? Now, it has to be said that the West has finally become sensitive to Islamist or jihadi terrorism that targets India. Groups like the Lashkar-e-Toyba or jaish e Mohammed, they have been referred to, uh, to, even in recent statements by American leaders, for example, they're talking about the Lashkar-e-Toyba and groups like that. And that may well be because jihadi terrorism affects the West as well. But let's not forget, there are other forms of terror too. And let's talk directly about Khalistani terrorism. A lot of people died as a result of Khalistani terror. 20,000, 22,000, something like that in the 80s and 90s. A lot of people died. And yes, it is a big deal in India, including in the Punjab. You can imagine how much it angers Indians when people seek to revive that, especially when those people aren't even in India. They are stirring up trouble in India from safe havens and comfortable homes in places like Canada or the UK or the US for that matter. Punjab itself, you must remember, is peaceful. No one wants Khalistan there. No one wants a return to those bad days of terrorism and violence. These are outsiders seeking to restart that bloodshed all over again. No wonder there is such a strong Indian reaction when countries like Canada just turn a blind eye to that terrorism. And it's not just today. It's been happening for 40 years. You all know the story of how Canadian negligence, quite frankly, led to the blowing up of an Air India plane. And then the accused getting away, slap on the wrist. That was 35 years ago. And all of that happened under the watch of Justin Trudeau's father. And that's why India will not and should not back down in this particular confrontation with Canada, because there is a principle here. Terror is terror. No ifs and buts. If you are concerned about terror that could target you, then you need to take all terror seriously. And that brings me to the rule of law. Canada says that the rule of law prevents targeted assassinations. The rule of law says that extrajudicial executions are wrong. They're a crime. Okay, that's fair enough. 
But then another question has to be asked. What then does the rule of law say about giving shelter to terrorists and extremists and giving them shelter for 40 long years? There is an inconsistency and a double standard here. That has to be called out and it needs to be addressed. And let's take this further to, to these statements we've heard from Canada, for example, about the Vienna Convention. The actions that the government of India took this week are themselves contrary to international law. The government of India decided to unilaterally revoke the diplomatic immunity of 40 Canadian diplomats in India. This is a violation of the Vienna Convention governing diplomacy. Now, two things come to mind. Number one, India has responded by very clearly saying that the Vienna Convention doesn't say anything about the number of diplomats who should be in place. In fact, it sort of leaves it up to the receiving country to specify what is a fair number of diplomats that they should be there. And therefore, India is saying that Trudeau and the other five eyes are frankly quite wrong in their claim that India is violating the Vienna Convention in any way. But more importantly, here is a question that needs to be asked. At its core, the Vienna Convention is about the protection of diplomats, their safety, and how that can be guaranteed by host nations. Now, if you take a look at any of these videos by people like the SJF's Pannu, look at what he is saying. He is directly inciting violence against Indian diplomats. There are posters being put up in Canada asking for the assassination of Indian diplomats. There are floats being paraded on the streets in Canada celebrating the death of an Indian Prime Minister. How is any of this, how is any of this even remotely compatible with either the rule of law or with the Vienna Convention? Quite frankly, it isn't. And if you think these are just empty words and you shouldn't take them seriously, they aren't. Indian embassies, consulates and high commissions have been repeatedly physically attacked by Khalistanis this year in just the last few months. And not just in Canada. These, for example, are scenes from the infamous attack in London on the Indian High Commission. And here is the Indian High Commissioner talking to me a little earlier this year from that very spot about genuine concerns about the safety of Indian diplomats. Day was that there was a group of about uh, 25 or 30 people who came, mm. and uh, obviously they had it had been pre-planned. They had cameras and so on and so forth, and uh, they scaled the balcony and were in the process of lowering the flag and trying to hand it over to their to their crew to desecrate it and yeah. to put up a Khalistani flag. And our security guys climbed into the balcony. And one yeah, of them, he actually came out and grabbed it back, which is yes. a brave guy. I, I, I'd love to meet him and shake his hand at some point. Well, you can only shake one hand because they managed to break his other arm in three places. Did with, they? Yeah, with lattes. I could go on and on, but you get the drift. This India-Canada issue is not going to go away soon, and it may well vitiate relations with others in the Anglosphere as well. And that's because terror, and Khalistani terror in particular in this case, is a red line to India. And India will expect Western countries to do something about it. And that's why the language being used by India for Canada in recent weeks, well, it may have surprised many people. And yes, I have only heard that language being used for one other country, and that's Pakistan. And that's the other country that India accuses of being a safe haven for terror. Now, Pakistan and Canada being spoken about in the same breath as safe havens for terror, now that should probably outrage many people in Canada. That should upset many people in Canada. And that should worry Trudeau and Canada. And if it does, and it does worry them, then quite frankly, the onus is on them to do something about it. Because that's the first step. And that's the first step that will lead to a resolution of this particular impasse. 
But in case you think those are just my views, let's get in a couple of strategic thinkers also to weigh in with their perspective. I'm, uh, Michael Kugelman is about to join us in a couple of minutes, but let me start with Brahma Chalani, one of the top strategic thinkers uh, here in India. Um, Brahma, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you know, when you look at this entire situation with Canada, in particular the Vienna Convention and Canada saying that India is violating the Vienna Convention in some way, as I was just saying, the Vienna Convention says you've got to take care of the security of diplomats. And if that's not being done in countries like Canada or the UK or anywhere else, then there's something fundamentally wrong somewhere. Well, there is something very strange happening, which is that those that are citing international law seem to believe that harboring terrorists or militants that are glorifying violence is okay, but a country, a receiving country, does not have the right to impose reasonable limits within the definition of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations on the other side's posting of diplomats. The fact is that international law very much gives a carte blanche to the receiving side to put reasonable limits on the number of diplomats it is willing to host from the sending side. But I think at the root of this India-Canada diplomatic spat is the fact that Canada has emerged as the global hub of the Khalistan movement. The irony is that the Khalistan movement has few backers in India, including in Punjab. The Khalistan movement, though, is alive and kicking largely in the Anglosphere, principally Canada, the UK, and the US, and to a smaller extent, Australia and New Zealand. These five English-speaking countries host the most prominent Khalistanis. But Brahma, I've been talking to many international analysts in recent weeks, and they're all somewhat surprised as to why India is taking such a hard line on this particular subject. And as I was just saying right now, may well have to do with the fact that terror is a red line for India. And uh, the entire question of Khalistani terror and safe havens given to Khalistani extremists in countries like Canada has been an irritant for India for a long time. And that's why India is taking such a hard line. Would you, would you agree with that view? Vikram, this diplomatic spat between India and Canada has reopened old wounds. Those wounds go back to the 1980s when Canada based Khalistani terrorists bombed an Air India flight, killing all 329 people on board. This was one of the worst acts of terrorism in history. The problem is this, history is repeating itself. In the 1980s, Canada's shielding of dangerous Sikh militants led to the twin bombings that targeted two separate Air India flights. One bombing misfired and killed two baggage handlers in Narita, but the other bombing from Canada resulted in all 329 people on board being killed. India let Canada off the hook over those bombings. Even, those, those, even though those bombings were caused by people that India had conveyed to Canada as, as being dangerous militants. In fact, India had requested Trudeau's father, then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, to extradite one Talvinder Paramar, the chief of the Babar Khalsa, who, according to two separate Canadian inquiries, went on to become the mastermind of the main Air India bombing. And now, today, we are seeing Canada becoming the international epicenter of the Khalistan movement. And Talvinder Parmar, the same mastermind of the, of the Air India bombing, is the big hero of the Canada-based Khalistanis. 
Brahma, I wanted to ask you, you know, whatever Canada is doing, okay, you could say that Justin Trudeau has a certain political constituency, he's playing to that, his, you know, his, his ally there, maybe he's playing along with that. Um, are you somewhat surprised that the US and the UK and even countries like New Zealand now all seem to be coming forward and making uh, public statements, seeming to back Canada in quite a strong manner? Why do you think that's happening? For two reasons. One, these five Anglosphere states always band together in any situation. And they issue statements in each other's support, even when the supporting country lacks its own independent evidence to make any kind of an assertion. The second reason being is that as members of the Five Eyes Intelligence community, these Anglophile states supply intelligence to each other. And Canada's allegation against India draws on intelligence supplied by the Americans. Now, this is something that the Americans don't want to say in public because they want to shield their relationship with India, which is quite important in the Asian context. But the fact is that American intelligence shared with Canada emboldened the Trudeau government to level an allegation against India that Trudeau himself has acknowledged in his own statement, the original statement that he made on the floor of House of Commons is nothing more than an allegation that too about potential, not actual link of the Indian government to a killing. Well, let's now get another perspective on that. Michael Kugelman now joins us, Director of South Asia Institute at the Wilson Center. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Now, we were having a discussion even in Washington, D.C., about the possible fallout uh, of this entire India-Canada issue. Now, right now, when these crises are happening in Ukraine and Russia and the Middle East and Israel and Gaza, I'm sure this would be a standoff that the U.S. and the world and the West in particular would be very happy not to see. How do you see it proceeding from here? Well, I mean, uh, if you're looking, if you're hoping for a, um, a de-escalation in the crisis, it is a good sign that uh, India announced that it will partially resume uh, visa services in, in Canada. That's significant. Um, you know, just because I think that these uh, these these visa suspensions, uh, visa processing suspensions, it it hits the relationship where it hurts the most. Just because people to people ties are a big part of the relationship. But you know, beyond that, um, my sense is that the trend lines uh, are not very positive at all. I don't see any type of rapprochement coming anytime soon. I mean, the fact that you know we now have a situation where Canada has removed two thirds, what had been two thirds of its diplomatic presence in Canada in in India. That's very significant. And for Canada to accuse India of violating international law, that's escalatory as well um, to say that. And, uh, you know, now there's, you know, there's there's some some talk about the possibility of India looking to bring Canada to the FATF. Um, you know, I, that hasn't been confirmed, but there has been talk about that. If that were to take place, that would clearly be uh, another an escalation of the crisis um, even more. And, uh, you know, my sense is that there's not much incentive on either side to back down, uh, quite frankly. And I think that for India, this is especially important. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's important for New Delhi to be projecting strength in the face of what it describes as a very serious external threat posed by, by Sikh separatists in Canada. Whereas, you know, in Ottawa, you know, the position, you know, they remain very uh, firm on their position that, um, you know, India is pressuring Canada to do something that it has no right to do. And that in Ottawa's view, you know, these uh, what India describes as serious security threats are, in fact, just activists that deserve to be protected by, you know, democratic principles like freedom of assembly, so on and so forth. So, you know, if you want but to call it, my... yeah, either side sorry. is willing to back down. Michael, I think you're right. And I, and I think, uh, as I was saying to you in Washington, D.C. as well, that there perhaps seems to have been a little misreading of the r mood in Delhi and how much of a red line, red button issue the entire question of terrorism and Khalistani terrorism is actually in India. Um, the view uh, increasingly now in India on other issues also is that it's almost bizarre for Canada or for other countries to be talking about the Vienna Convention and the parity of diplomats when the first principle of the Vienna Convention is the safety of diplomats. And people are being given shelter and safe haven in some countries. 
people who are making direct threats against Indian diplomats. Uh, look at what happened to the Indian High Commission in London. They, they roughed up uh, you know, Indian security officers out there. That is a breach of the Vienna Convention. Right. I mean, one of the reasons why this crisis is as serious as it is, is that there's some very sharp disconnects between the two sides on, on many issues. One would be what I described before in terms of how each side perceives the threat posed by uh, by by these Khalistan uh, supporters. But indeed, what you said is also accurate. You know, Canada's position, as I understand it, is that uh, it was India's threat to uh, revoke the diplomatic immunity of these Canadian diplomats that they didn't leave. That was what it viewed as a violation of international law. But um, but you're right. I mean, it goes much much further than that. And you know, your the external affairs minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, also indicated that um, you know there's that it's perfectly legal and within the realm of the Vienna, Vienna conventions to promote the principle of parity, which entails you know having similarly uh, sized uh, diplomatic um, contingents in, in in different countries. So again, it depends where you sit, depends where you stand. Each capital looks at this issue very differently. All right, Michael Krugman, thank you so much for joining us with that perspective. Thank you. And that's all we have time for on this episode of the India Story. But we'll be back again next week, keeping a track of all that's happening in India and around the world. And as always, getting the big names to talk to you about them. Bye for now.